Namaste. I want to bring you a very important piece of wisdom. You know, in most of our videos, we are talking about the lower stages of self-realization. Dvaita Vada, the dualistic view. Vishisha Dvaita Vada, the conditioned non-duality view, bhakti yoga, and vivartavada, the stage of meditation. And actually most of our videos are on the vivartavada. If you look at our course site, the predominant number of videos are on this stage. Why? Well, it's easy to get instructions and information on karma yoga and bhakti yoga. But it's not so easy to get good instruction on meditation. Most of what passes as meditation is actually just another form of concentration. Uh, for example, concentrating on a mantra or concentrating on a particular deity or something like that. These actually belong in the lower classifications. Just like many teachings try to masquerade as bhakti, but they're really just karma yoga <clears throat> because they're running according to rules and regulations. And then finally, the highest stage is ajatavada. Ajatavada means the world was never born. And this is the highest stage. And this stage is the same as nibbana, or nirvana, taught by the Buddha. That one transcends all form, even consciousness. And let me substantiate that rather outrageous claim by reading from the Buddha. From what? are sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair born. How are they produced? Here, bhikkhus, an uninstructed worldling, the Pali word is putujana, huh? and in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the same type of person is called puranjana, basically, someone who lives from the senses. So anyway, this uninstructed person, this non-spiritual person, unskilled, undisciplined person, regards form as self, or self as possessing form. This is my body. My body is me or form as in self, or self as in form. That form of his changes and alters, and with the change and alteration of form, there arise in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. Why do people become, why do they despair when they get old? because the form is changing. That's all. Actually, they should despair when they're young because the form is changing even more. But there they have the false hope that when I grow up, I'll be able to enjoy. Well, maybe. <laughs> Depends on your karma. But one thing is for sure, for everybody, this form will change, and eventually it will cease to operate. So what does the Buddha say? He regards feeling as self, perception 
as self. Volitional formations, sankhara, huh? or will and desire, as self. Consciousness as self or self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That consciousness of his changes and alters, and when it changes and alters, he experiences sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. So consciousness is a form of suffering, Or, to be more precise, the changes in consciousness make suffering arise because one considers I am consciousness. So because everything that has form, including consciousness, changes, it's impermanent. Huh? Every day this happens to us. We wake up in the morning go through the day with constantly changing images and perceptions in consciousness, and then we're so exhausted and wound up by the end of the day, we have to sleep, and then in that sleep we have dreams full of all kinds of other objects and stuff. <laughs> and then finally, finally, we get to totally relax and go into deep sleep. And there we are refreshed. And then in the morning, we wake up and do the whole thing all over again. Why? It's only because we regard consciousness as the self. Or the self in consciousness. Huh? Or consciousness as belonging to the self. But consciousness is not self. The Buddha says so right here. It's very difficult to find the teachings on this level. Some of Ramana Maharshi's teachings touch upon it, and some others, but most of the time, even in the Vedic context, consciousness is as high as they get. Now, I mean, certainly, to consider oneself as consciousness is a higher stage than considering oneself to be the body or even the mind. Huh? Because those things change even more than consciousness. And of course, at the end, one has to give them up. But even so, if you really want to eradicate suffering, you have to come to the conclusion, you have to come to the view that consciousness is also suffering. Perception is also suffering. Any kind of change or disturbance is suffering. It may be very subtle, but it's still there. And the proof of this is that we have to sleep. We have to give up consciousness. We have to let it go and rest and get recharged from Brahman. Huh? But wait a minute, we are Brahman. <laughs> so why is it that we have to rest and be refreshed? Because we're carrying so many upadis and vasanas. Upadis cover up our original nature, and vasanas are the uh, predispositions of the mind. In other words, our karmic conditioning from previous lives and experiences. So because of upadis and vasanas, we have to work so hard uh, to support them. And especially, we have to work to create the illusion of I, the individual self with a small s. This is almost like a movie projector. A movie is really a bunch of still frames. This movie included. Huh? There's a bunch of still frames strung together at 30 frames a second or 24 or whatever it is. And this creates the illusion of continuous 
action, continuous movement. But actually, each one is a still picture. In the same way, the mind creates the illusion of a continuously existing ego, individual self, by blasting many, many frames a second, uh, which are all static. But when they're put together, they create the illusion of a continuously existing self. So this is the source, this is the cause, this is the arising of suffering. Now, what does Buddha say? How do we get rid of this suffering? But bhikkhus, when one has understood the impermanence of form, its change fading away and cessation, and when one sees as it really is, with correct wisdom, thus, in the past and also now, all form is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. When one sees like this, huh? this is right view. This is seeing as it is. Then sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair are abandoned. With their abandonment, one does not become agitated. Being unagitated, one dwells happily. A bhikkhu who dwells happily is said to be quenched. Quenched. And what is the word for quenched? Nibbuto smi. I am quenched. Of course, nibbuto means becoming extinguished like a flame. If I take a candle, a lit candle, and blow it out, uh, we say the fire, the flame goes out. Well, where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere. Simply the conditions that gave rise to that flame have changed. So the flame cannot continue as a phenomenon. The same thing happens when we abandon thinking that this self is real, this ego is an actual thing. Huh? When we abandon that wrong view, then the flame of suffering goes out because the conditions needed to sustain it have changed. Finally, the Buddha concludes, when one has understood the impermanence of feeling, of perception, of volitional formations, sankhara, of consciousness, its change fading away and cessation, and when one sees as it really is with correct wisdom thus, in the past and also now, all consciousness is impermanent. Suffering and subject to change. This is right view on consciousness. Then sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair are abandoned. When they are abandoned, one does not become agitated. Being unagitated, one dwells happily. A bhikkhu who dwells happily is said to be quenched. Nibhuto ti. Huh? Well, this is Nibbana. This is how to attain Nibbana. So what does this look like? What is the experience of this like? Well, in most forms of meditation, one tries to withdraw the attention from the senses. That's a good first step. But that's not really meditation. That's just concentration, huh? pratyahara in the yoga system, pratyahara. And then dharana, concentration of the mind on a certain object. Now, in my practice, I use a mantra, the Maha Sodashi mantra, which you'll find, here's a link to it, you'll find in our uh, video series. But you can use any mantra. Huh? 
The point of the mantra is to give the mind something to do other than uh, scanning the senses or thinking about stuff. Because the mind is also a type of consciousness, consciousness of thoughts. And that consciousness is also suffering and impermanent and so on. So to keep the mind out of trouble, we give it a toy, you know, like a baby that's crying. Baby that's crying or a young child is getting in some mischief. Huh? Just give him a toy and then he, he's satisfied and he can go play with it. So to distract the mind and keep it busy, we give it a mantra to concentrate on. Then the real meditation can start. And what is that? Giving up consciousness. Abandoning this source of suffering. Because if you think about it, everything that's suffering has to do with consciousness. Just look at the situation in the world today. People are suffering because their consciousness had to change. Because now they're locked down, they can't go to work or whatever. They can't do what they wanted to do or what they used to do. Consciousness has changed, or really the contents of consciousness have changed. But for most people, that's the same thing. So when consciousness changes, it causes suffering. So what is the ultimate solution to that? Is to abandon consciousness. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's nihilism. That's the destruction of the self. That's annihilationism. And some people criticize the Buddha like that. But he said, no, no. Come and see. Try it for yourself. Huh? He, he didn't describe Nibbana in a positive way, only in a negative way. That when all these things stop and are given up, abandoned, then there's the Nibbana. But he never described actually Nibbana. Well, I'm going to try. <laughs> when you give up consciousness, there you find there's still something left. And that is your original awareness and your original self. Self with a capital S, Brahman. Now the thing about Brahman is it's unconditional being, Sat. And it's pure consciousness or really pure awareness without an object, Chit. And it's unlimited bliss, Ananda. Why is everybody so happy and relieved to go to sleep at night? Because they go into this state of Brahman. Huh? They lay aside all the upadis and the vasanas and they just rest in the lap of Brahman. But in true meditation, in the Ajatavada, in Jnana Yoga, you become Brahman. And you do this by laying aside all form, all change, including consciousness. Consciousness is always awareness of an object. So it means giving up all the sense objects, including the mind. And just being aware of awareness itself. This awareness of awareness is chittam, uh, the unconditioned consciousness of Brahman. When I'm in meditation, I experience this as complete peace and an unlimited field like an ocean of light that just doesn't change. There's no form, no shape, no color, no attributes, no time, no distance, no space, no nothing. This is Nibbana. This is, a, this is the highest enlightenment. Now, anybody can experience this anytime. 
There are no special qualifications needed. But, as a practical matter, we find people have to give up their upadis and their vasanas little by little. They can't just abandon everything. Huh? Only a great soul who has many lifetimes of preparation can suddenly abandon, like Ramana Maharshi. Uh, even the Buddha took him seven years of sadhana to reach Nibbana. And to do that, he had to give up all other forms, all other practices, all other types of meditation. Now, I don't know why this is, but it's very hard to get anyone to be straight with you about this. That's why I decided to make this video, because now is a time of great need. And if you make the effort, you can approach this. If not attain it, at least you can approach it. And you can get the tremendous relief that results from the abandonment of the causes of suffering, including consciousness. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.